and June 14th in New Orleans was yesterday. Or anywhere in the Western Hemisphere, actually. So this weekend, we got to celebrate Srila Prabhupada's appearance many times. And it's wonderful. Ah. <coughs> <clears throat> I thought it might be and uh, well he was almost 20 I was almost 19 uh, in Hawaii somebody had the brilliant idea that we should celebrate various, well, at least the first idea was let's celebrate the new year um, in Diamond Head Crater. Now, if you don't know what or where Diamond Head Crater is, if you've ever seen a picture of Hawaii or of Waikiki Beach, the most famous postcard type pictures, it has, you know, the beach, and then in the background it has this this mountain or hill that almost looks like the fin, the back fin of a fish. That's Diamond Head. The reason it's called Diamond Head is because some sailors found some crystals there and they thought they were diamonds. <laughs> they weren't. Uh, but the Hawaiian name of that hill is Laiahi, which means the back fin of the tuna fish or Ahi. And that year, unofficially, they had to get some kind of permits for it, I think, but there was no official, like there was no big sponsorship behind it or anything. They just decided that a bunch of people were going to go and go into Diamond Head Crater and celebrate January 1st, the New Year's Day. And they, uh, if this was the flat area of Diamond Head inside, in order to go into the crater, you had to go through a tunnel that went through the side of the crater into the crater. And then once you got in, there was a large flat area. Uh, on, one, on one side were a bunch of military buildings, low-rise military buildings. But the rest of the whole crater was just this big field. Um, and when you, my girlfriend and I at the time uh, decided that uh, we would go. We didn't know if anybody would be there. We didn't know what was going to happen there. But we thought we'd go. You walk through the tunnel. It's about maybe 60 feet, uh, maybe um, 20 yards, 20 meters through the tunnel. And you come out on the other side and you're met by a wall of smoke, marijuana smoke. And so you uh, walk through all the haze and then um, if you would walk through like over there and you come out and there was a local band playing over there. Over here were all kinds of shops selling beads and hippie stuff and mirrors and this and that and knickknacks. And then over here was another band playing. And over here, just as, just as you came in, was a large tent uh, where you would come in and register. You have to sign in and register that you were there and everything. And they gave you a, like a schedule of events for the day. But then Lori and I, my girlfriend and I, were walking and we walked down this way so that we could kind of look, look across and see the band and see the vendors and some people were selling food and so on and so forth. And um, so we were walking across this way, looking that way towards what was going on. And somewhere 
in the middle, there was a, a tent. Now, this tent was about, about as big as from the edge of the door to the edge of the temple and then back. And uh, outside of the tent was a, a little piece of furniture, and there were a whole bunch of pamphlets stacked up on that piece of furniture. And I went over and I grabbed the pamphlet and I looked at it. It was called Simple Meditations by Sai, S-A-I. I looked at it. I looked through it a little bit. And I thought, this is interesting. This is really cool. I've, I've heard about meditation. By that time, of course, Maharishi had, had spread the idea of, of silent meditation. And, um, and uh, I heard a voice inside the tent saying, you know, just take one and come on in. And... Um, Lori didn't want to go. She's like, I don't want to go in there. I don't have any interest in that. And so I said, well, why don't you go and check out the bands and check out the, the stuff, and uh, I'll go in and I'll meet you later. So I went into the tent. If you, if you go in like this way into the tent, I, I sat. I was one of the first, I don't know, three or four people in the tent and Prabhupada was sitting back there on a, on a shelf in lotus posture. And so I sat rather close, a couple meters from him. And some other people came in and some other people came in. And pretty soon there was 20 or so, or so people in the tent. In the meantime, Prabhupada is just sitting there in lotus posture. And, you know saying nothing. But the very wonderful, interesting thing was that he glowed. He glowed. Now, <clears throat> there is a scientific reason for this because the tent was facing in such a way that as the sun rose over the mountain, it struck the back of the tent. And so the back of the tent was very bright and Prabhupada was right there in the middle of it and just looked like it looked like he was glowing. It was a wonderful, wonderful sight. And um, I couldn't help thinking that my goodness, it looks like he's glowing. And then uh, He said, you have each gotten the book, Simple Meditations? Yes, okay. You may have it. It's free. You don't have to pay anything for it. Uh, and he said, meditation is a way to find real happiness. It is a way to discover your real purpose. And he said, and the first basic thing that you need to understand is that you are not the body. And I'm like, what? He said it again. You are not the body. Said, Come on. What do you mean I'm not the body? I've spent my whole life trying to look good, trying to be cool, trying to 
trying to, you know, I was going to be an actor. I was going to be a model. And I'm like, how is that, how is that even possible? I and mean, this whole idea was just out of left field, just so new to me. I had never heard anything like it before. And I went to a religious school. They didn't teach that. And he said, just as an example, if you were to remove, someone were to cut off your hand, and your hand was over there, and the rest of you is over here, where are you? Are you there with your hand? Or are you here? Which part of you is you? Or what if somebody just fell dead right here in front of us, here in this tent? And you check and you say, well, no, he's, he's dead, he's gone. And I say, no, he's not. he's not gone, he's right here. Look, there's his feet, there's his head, there's his eyes, there's his hands, there's his tummy, there's his butt. He's all there. <clears throat> yeah, but no, no, he's gone. He's gone. He is no longer in that body. The body dies, but you are the eternal spirit within the body. And then he went on to explain that there's a, a simple, one of, my, one of these simple meditations. I mean, we did, you know, we did Om Tat Sat and Om Mani Padmi Ham and, and we did uh, a little bit of Amitabha and things like that, these uh, meditations. But then he said, you know, a very simple way to understand or to remind yourself that you're not the body <coughs> is to use this simple meditation. Wherever you are, wherever you happen to be, whatever you happen to be doing, whether you're eating dinner or doing your homework or uh, writing a book or watching television, if you stop for a second and say to yourself, I am aware that I am eating dinner or watching TV. I am aware that I am ironing the clothes. I am aware that I am writing. I am aware that I am driving my car. This allows you to separate yourself from your body a little bit and give you a reminder that you are not the body. Well, you could have knocked me over with a feather. I was just, I was blown away. I, I walked out of the tent and I didn't, uh, I, I don't know how I found my girlfriend again. I wasn't really that interested anymore. Um, but the fact that maybe she could go out, maybe you should go outside. or sit the other way. Hello? My dear. Thank you. <laughs> I was totally screwed up at that time. I, um, didn't know what I was going to do with my life. I, my girlfriend was pregnant. I was, uh, her parents hated me. My parents didn't appreciate me very much either at the time. I had no purpose. I had no meaning in my life. I was, directionless and all the things that I had tried to give me meaning I'd looked into gosh 
I looked into a number of religions, Catholicism, Baha'i, uh, Buddhism, so many different religions that I'd looked into, and none of them seemed to really answer the questions that I had or give me a feeling of uh, connection. But when I heard Prabhupada say that, I, I thought, this guy, I don't know who he is, but he has something. And I want to find out what it is. And I would like to have it. Whatever he's got, I want it. That was the first time I met Srila Prabhupada. A couple months later, <coughs> um, I was living on a, on a boat, literally living on a boat in uh, the yacht harbor in Honolulu. And uh, it was kind of a weird place to live, but our whole family lived on this 21-foot boat. 30-foot boat. Anyway, it was a boat. And somehow or other, all four of us squeezed into that little boat and we lived on. But there were some young people my age around the Yacht Harbor that lived, also lived on boats. And one day we decided, they were into um, dirt bike racing, you know, going around and around and jumping up the things and going down. And they were really into that. And one day we all decided there was a dirt bike exhibition and race on the North Shore out near Sunset Beach. So we decided that we would ride our bicycles out to the North Shore. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever been to Oahu or not, but a bicycle ride between the Honolulu Harbor and the North Shore is a little bit like going from here to Bicol on your bike. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's a long ways. And, but we did it. We made it somehow or other. We made it out to the North Shore. And uh, at we, we, we stopped at this place called Cammy's, which is a very kind of a central, central, it was North Shore Central at the time. Everybody went there to get snacks and juice and chips and what have you. <coughs> and they decided that they wanted to go on to this, this dirt bike race. And I was, I, I was just excited to be out at the North Shore. I mean, I was at Sunset Beach. Yeah. Where all the surfers go in, and Waimea Bay is right over there, and Pipeline, and all these beaches that I'd heard so much about, I'd never been there. And somehow or other, I'm not exactly sure how, somebody, I think somebody said, you, well, you know, one way to go is to go down that driveway there past the A frames. Everybody knew where the A frames were. It was these houses that were built like A frames. There were four of them. And everybody said, go to the, ra go to the A frames, go down the driveway there, and, that, and there's a right of way to the beach. And go there. So I went down the trail and up, up the hill to the, to the beach. And I was sitting on the beach looking out at, it was the summertime, so there wasn't much happening wave wise. Um, but I found out later it was a place called Rocky Point. And on my way past the A-frames, you go past the A-frames on the path, it's on, they're on your right, and then you go past a, a little garden or field or whatever, and then there's a, a, a Quonset hut that is up on the beach. And the Quonset hut is built in such a way that it's, it, it goes across this way and then it goes down because the, the ground goes down and so there's a there's a basement part 
and then there's the, the regular upper part of the Quonset hut. Now, if you don't know what a Quonset hut is, it's a, it's a, round, it's a round building, kind of looks like that. It's got metal. The, the army built a million of them back during World War II. They probably built a bunch of them here, too. Um, but anyway, I was sitting on the beach, and um, I looked off in the distance, and there's these two dogs coming, coming towards me, big dogs, and they were white. They were snow white. Beautiful dogs. I have no idea what kind of dogs they were. They weren't German Shepherds, and they weren't. They were, they were just these beautiful white dogs. And they came up to me, and shortly thereafter, this this girl that was, I guess, you know, they were her dogs, came up to me, and and she looked at me and said, "Oh, hi, Gray. How you doing?" I'm like, I look at her. Oh my gosh, it's my high school classmate, Kathy Hoshijo. And I'm like, wow, uh, so what are you up to? And she's like, well, you know, a lot of people are into kind of a, like a higher consciousness, kind of like meditation and things like, yeah, I've heard of that. That's really cool. And, um, and she said, well, I got married and I, I have a baby, but I live right over there in the Quonset hut, at Arma hut. You ask people on the North Shore, where's the Quonset hut? They don't know what you're talking about, but you ask, where's Arma hut? And everybody knows where it is. And the reason it's called Arma hut is because the way it's built on the, on the North Shore there, it kind of looks like an armadillo sitting there. So she says, um, uh, I have a good friend named Sai. He's coming. Uh, he'll be speaking tonight at the Quonset Hut. Why don't you come by? And so an hour or so later, I came by and knocked on the basement apartment door. And I walk in. And there is everything I ever wanted. A big bed with the uh, Indian uh, bedspread. On the bed is this beautiful baby boy lying asleep on his back. And then all like kind of decorated like this, you know, all these wonderful decor. And then her husband, Shananda, is sitting over in a chair in med meditating. And then over here, there's a, like a sink and then there's a curtain, like a curtain, like around, as if it would go around between the, the door and the window there, which I found out later was a bathroom. And Kathy was in there, and she said, Hi, Gray, sit down, and, um, you know, we'll, we'll go upstairs in a minute. And so we sat down, and Shinanda, you know, said, Well, why don't we do some meditation? And so we, we sat there, uh, oming for a few minutes, a little while. And then Kathy came out, and we went upstairs. And we're sitting upstairs, and later I found out uh, the way that the, the Quonset Hut was set up was that you walk in the, the door, and there was a bar on one side all the way, all the way down, and then a big area, flat area, with hardly any furniture or anything. And then, on, on, then there was a little hallway, and on the left was a bathroom and a shower, and on the right was a little bedroom. And Prabhupada was in the bedroom. I didn't know it at the time, but he lived there. And he came out. And he began to lead us in various kinds of meditation and talk about uh, impersonalist philosophy, the philosophy of uh, uh, that everything is one, everything is uh, uh. He mostly, at that time, 
talked of, uh, of uh, this teaching of uh, uh, Ramakrishna, who pretty much destroyed <laughs> uh, religion for people for a long, long time. But Prabhupada didn't. He his awareness at the time was the Brahma Jyoti. And that was, that was his enlightenment, was Brahma Jyoti. And people that are enlightened in the Brahma Jyoti are enlightened. They are truly enlightened. It is a, it is a, uh, a step of enlightenment. And so he would talk about that. And I was very attracted. And Kayani shared her apple with me, or Kathy shared her apple with me. And... Uh, and then Shananda put a, after it was over, Shananda put a, a, a blanket on the grass outside the hut and told me I could sleep there. The next morning he came up and gave me a piece of, a loaf of bread that they had actually baked themselves. And again, I was blown away. I mean, this is the kind of life that I wanted, you know, baking my own bread, growing my own food, you know, this is very attractive. And uh, and then a while later, I went to one of Prabhupada's retreats on Maui. He had a big house up on in Haiku. And he would hold two-week retreats every once in a while at the house and teach meditation, different forms of meditation and philosophy and, and uh, so every day we would get up very early before sunrise, practice meditation, trying to raise the kundalini. Uh, and during the day after the, after the morning meditation we would go out and help in the garden, weed the garden or or uh, uh, get rid of the worms or the insects. It was all organic. So if you wanted to get rid of a worm, Prabhupada said, if you don't, if you, uh, you know, you need to kill the worms. You need to kill them. If you don't feel good about killing a worm, just give them to me. I'll take care of it. And, I mean, I was like, you know, gosh, kill something? I was... Of course, I didn't have any problem with eating chickens but at that time. But I was, getting, I was getting more and more into this healthy philosophy, vegetarian philosophy, and so forth. And so the idea of killing one of these worms that was eating the plants was... Uh, I felt a little queasy about it. And Prabhupada came over to me one time in the garden and said, here, just give them to me. So I, I gave this... It was like this long and about this big around and I gave it to Prabhupada and he squished its head just like that he said you have to do it fast no pain very quickly he said that's the that's the key there was no suffering there's not suffering and so I learned something and uh Prabhupada had just come off of a, uh, a two-week fast. He had been fasting on uh, juice, as I recall. And uh, so I decided that, you know, during this two weeks that I was at this retreat, I would fast. I mean, if he could do it, I could do it, right? And I, so lasted about three days. And I didn't want anybody to know that I was going to, that I was extremely hungry and I was decided I was going to break my fast so I snuck off the off the farm and I snuck over behind some trees and there were some pineapple bushes growing on the ground and so I I I picked one of the pineapples they were, they were they're small really cool small little pineapples they were ripe and twist the top off peel it with my fingernails and eat the pineapple. <laughs> I was so hungry. 
Of course, I, I didn't tell anybody that, you know, I was, wasn't still fasting. And, but I think my lips gave me away because the acid from the pineapple made my, made my lips all red and sore. Then the last day of the retreat came and one of the, 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 the house was really, really big. It was built by a Japanese family back before World War II. And in one, there was a, a building that was dedicated to the furo. Do you know what a furo is? A furo is a Japanese bathtub. It's a great big iron tub. And there was, a, I, mean, I mean, it's big. And uh, so one building was dedicated to the furo, and that was the bathing room. And then uh, up the stairs, there was a, a porch. The Prabhupada used to sit on the railing of the porch. It was a big wooden railing about this wide. And then you go through the front door, and there was a big living room where, where um, some meditation and philosophy classes were given. And then through that, the next door, there was a meditation room where it was kept dark with candles and everything. Then there was a kitchen. And then there was a, a back room where Prabhupada slept. And then there was another room, kind of an ante room, a little office or something on the side. So he and his assistant, a guy named Chris, they put us into this little office room. And um, we're all sitting there. I mean, I met so many people there. Sudama Vipra was there. Sudama stood out, not because he was so advanced, but because he was so pissed off at everybody and everything and life. And, you know, I mean, he didn't have a good word to say about anything or anybody. And he was like, Burr. You know, always, you know, uh. and I remember thinking, well, <laughs> he's not going to last long. Turns out I was the one that didn't last long. And he gave all of his anger and all of his life to Srila Prabhupada not long after that. It's amazing. I met Kuvera there. I met Brahmana Tirtha. Uh, so many people that I later I came to know later. But anyway, we were all in this little room and Chris would come and say, okay, you, come with me. And they, you, they'd go out the door and he'd close the door. And then, I don't know if I can do this, I don't have anything to, to pound on, but um, after the door closed, there was silence for a while. And this is like, this is like six o'clock in the morning or so. And then you'd hear boom, 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 boom. Boom, 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 boom. And then silence for a while. And then Chris would come to the door, open the door and say, okay, you, come. And everybody's in there like, what's going on? What's, what's happening? And so then you'd hear the same thing. Boom, 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 boom. Boom, 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 boom. So finally he came to the door and he pointed at me and he said, okay, you come on. I went out the door, he closed the door, he said, turn around, and he put a blindfold on me. He tied a blindfold so I couldn't see. And then somebody took my hand, my arm, and led me through the house not just walking through the house, but trotting through the house. Boom, 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 boom. Into the living area. Boom, 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 boom. Into the meditation area. Boom, 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 boom. And I'm guessing. 
I'm guessing that's where we were. Boom, 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 boom. Then up the stairs. Boom, 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 boom. Boom, 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 across. Boom, 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 around. Boom, 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 back down the stairs. Boom, 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 boom. Out to the porch. Boom, 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 boom. Then back around the living room, back towards the the ante room. Boom, 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 boom. And then walking took me. My my arm just said, okay, just come come with me. Boying, come here. And I'm blindfolded still, but I think from the smells that we're in the kitchen somewhere. And so uh, he, he takes my hand and he says, uh, okay. Now, I recognize his voice. This is Sri Prabhupada's Sai. And he said, okay, make a honey finger. What? Make a honey finger. I, 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 I had no idea what that was. What's a honey finger? He said, okay, look. And he sticks my finger into a jar of honey. <laughs> and he takes it out and he sticks it in my mouth. And he whispers in my ear. He said, the road may not be straight and narrow, there may be many turns and twists, bumps along the way. But if you stick with me, I will bring you to the honey. I'll never forget that. Last story. A few months later, I was living with this old lady she was like the world's first hippie. And, uh, and she looked like you, actually. <laughs> and um, I told her, you know, I'd met this guy, and this guy named Sai, and, and that there was this, uh, you know, he, he taught this meditation, and she's like very skeptical. You know, I've seen these guys before. This is all, you know, just a bunch of... Uh, Well, at that time, they didn't have new age nonsense, but that's pretty much what she said it was. Just a bunch of BS. And um, I said, no, 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 no. Really, let's, uh, I tell you what, let's go up there. She had a car. Let's go up there and uh, I'll I'll introduce you to him and maybe, maybe you can learn something. Well, very reluctantly, she finally said, okay, well, all right, I'll, let's go. So we went up there to the Haiku Meditation Center is what it was called. And you have to park outside on the road and then you go down the driveway and then across a bridge and then up the driveway to where the house was. And she and I just walked up to the house, uninvited, unannounced. I mean, you know, we could have been shot. But uh, Chris came out and said, "Yo, yeah, come on up. We're about to have, we're about to have lunch, and Sai is going to speak." And uh, so we went up and sat on the porch. Actually, there was only about five of us there, five or six of us, and uh, Sai was. If you want to talk, please go outside. I don't mind. What's unfortunate is if you talk and everybody else is listening, trying to hear what you're saying, and they're missing out on Srila Prabhupada. Okay? So please, go outside if you want to talk. If you want to listen, stay. Excuse me. So we all sat down on the front porch. 
we all had a, I don't know, cracker or a cookie or something and some water. Pi pineapple juice. Pineapple juice. Because they used to get it free from the company. They had so much of it. The pineapple companies had so much of it. They would get, you know, gallon jugs of pineapple juice. And so we were drinking pineapple juice. And Prabhupada sat there and he says, you know, a lot of people have a higher type of meditation that I'd like to introduce you to. Um, and it's, uh, it is, this is a new type of yoga. It's not Siddha yoga, it's not, hot, it's not Hatha yoga, it's not Kundalini yoga. It's called Bhakti. And so I want to teach you this mantra, and let's have a little kirtan. Kirtan means chanting this mantra. And so here we are. I'm thinking that he's going to introduce us all to some kundalini thing or some silent meditation thing. And, and here we are chanting the Hare Krishna mantra. And I'm like, my gosh, where did that come from? And... I was just, I was blown away because I had heard about the Hare Krishnas coming to Hawaii. There was a newspaper article about it, and I read about it, and I thought, well, that's not going to last very long. A bunch of people chanting and dancing, you know, you got to sit down, you got to be quiet, you got to meditate. You know, that was my, that was my uh, consciousness at the time. And I thought this, this, this was antithetical to everything that I knew about Eastern religion and, and enlightenment and all these things. And, and then now all of a sudden this person that I've admired for so long, he's adopting the same thing. I found out later that he had met Gorshunder and, and uh, um, Govinda Dasi, and, and they had given him a book. I'm not sure if it was Bhagavad Gita or Teachings of Lord Chaitanya or what, but he read the book and he was immediately, he immediately, this, this, this is the completion of enlightenment. This is real enlightenment. And he began to teach it. And of course, everybody, all of his old students resisted. They were all like, what is going on? And so, he taught us so slowly, so just a little bit at a time, little bit, little bit, little bit, just what we could, baby, 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 baby steps. What we could, what we could uh, uh, assimilate, you know, at the time. And he, he still did something called psychic sleep where, you know, the relaxation technique that, that, um, that, um, Mm. Papa's wife does uh, Wailana that Wailana does the relaxation technique and, and he did he did that still and that was that, that kind of fulfilled my my requirement of some meditation some you know kind of like silent meditation and um, and that that was Not long thereafter, I, <laughs> I showed up on his doorstep at the Quonset hut and, and asked him if I could become his disciple. <coughs> anyway, that's the very earliest stories and remembrances that I have of my spiritual master, Srila Prabhupada. Uh, his mercy was... I mean, he... When he would teach us, he would still teach us in the Quonset hut. We'd all be sitting around in the Arma hut. And we, I mean, we, we asked the stupidest questions. 
we ask things like, um, why does the second prayer of Lord Chaitanya say that, you know, many names like Rama, Krishna, uh, and Damodar, and so forth, but the third prayer says name. It doesn't say names. It says name. Why is that? Why are there names and then there's a name? I mean, I can just see him going, oh, my God. Well, you know, you pick a name and you... He has many names, but now in the third prayer, you're focusing on one name. I mean, he, he was so merciful. He would take us by the hand. and say, Okay, it's this way. You do it this way. And you do that. And, uh, ah. well, most of us, well, at least for myself, I was the most idiotic disciple, so-called disciple. I just, I questioned everything. I, I, I was not a very good disciple. Never have been, probably never will be. But that was my meeting and early remembrances of Srila Prabhupada. So are there any questions? Questions? Anyone? <laughs>